I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The geography of the Americas, it's a bad joke. Imagine you're a merchant in Europe a couple hundred years ago, and you need to get your ships to Asia for those sweet, sweet spices. You could traverse the largest continent on Earth on the back of camels, or sail all the way around Africa. Both very dangerous and expensive. Or just go west. Because despite what people might say about you hundreds of years from now, you actually do know that the world's a farking globe. The problem is when you go west, there's this ridiculous skinny continent that stretches from north to south pole. And just to add insult to injury, it narrows down to only 80 kilometers wide at one point. It's just mocking you at that point. It's just rude. And it's impenetrable. There's mountains, there's rainforests, there's mosquitoes spraying malaria, poison frogs spreading poison. You could sail thousands of miles to get around it all, but the north route is covered with ice and the southern route is covered with nightmares. It would take hundreds of years for technology to make it possible to build the Panama Canal at the cost of hundreds of lives. But since then, the amount of commercial shipping around the world has increased exponentially. In fact, it's gone up 300% just since 1992. And yet there's still just one way through this continental middle finger to global commerce. But what if there were more? In the chaos following the inauguration of Donald Trump, a lot of announcements were made. Some were kind of expected, others, not so much. And above all, China is operating the Panama Canal, and we didn't give it to China, we gave it to Panama, and we're taking it back. This caught a lot of us by surprise, but it has refocused a lot of attention on the Panama Canal as one of the most important and strategic locations on Earth, especially when it comes to defense and shipping. We live in a globalized economy where countless industries rely on shipping parts from one side of the planet to the other. And granted, a lot of this is done by air these days, but still the cheapest way to move things around the world is on container ships. The Panama Canal is a lucrative and critical part of the world supply chain. And the reason the president wants it is because he thinks that China's taking control of it. Brace yourself, it's, it's not true. Don't get me wrong, China definitely has a stake in the canal, absolutely. Uh, Chinese companies like C.K. Hutchison have contracts to operate some of the ports, but they don't like have the deed to them. Like they can't just start like stacking hotels on the locks or charging ships for stopping on them. But still some in the current administration are worried that China might take control of the canal by taking over private corporations. Ironically, <laughs> since he signaled his intention to try to take over the Panama Canal, the opposite has actually started happening. Uh, for example, BlackRock just agreed to buy some ports from a Chinese company for $19 billion. And despite all the rhetoric, the United States still has a huge presence in the canal. 40% of America's containers are shipped through the canal, and almost three quarters of the cargo ships that move through the canal are coming either to or from America, amounting to about $4 trillion worth of goods. But the Panama Canal is brittle. Disruptions range from obvious problems like dock worker strikes and spikes in global fuel prices that make it more expensive to move goods to indirect issues like wars that create shifts in trade routes. But right now, the biggest problem at the Panama Canal is the droughts that have reduced lake levels and created havoc with the ships and the locks. So a big part of the canal design is Gatun Lake, which is an artificial lake created by the Gatun Dam, which goes across the Chagres River. Gatun Lake sits 89 feet above sea level and ships have to go through a series of locks to get up to the level of the lake so that they can sail across it. But those locks are fed by water from the lake, which is fed by the Chagres River, which is fed by rainwater. So when droughts hit the area, there's not enough water in the lake for the locks to work properly, which is exactly what happened during a drought last year. It created a log jam of 89 vessels clogging up hundreds of billions of dollars of goods. And you think you have constipation problems. The canal's chief sustainability officer said 2023 was the second driest year of all time for the Panama Canal. The water level is one and a half meters shorter than usual. And then there's the canal's age. It's over a hundred years old now, and it's gonna need more than an artificial hip and blood thinners to get back in shape. The canal's equipment and locks have undergone expensive upgrades like the one it got in 2019, but that's still not a complete guarantee for all of its problems. The older it gets, the more the canal's equipment deteriorates and fails, creating more room for accidents. Um, in 2023, a tugboat actually got pushed up against a closed lock gate by another ship before it could open, uh, which caused delays for days. There's also been uh, several near misses between vessels and boats, and there have been boats that have been like scraping up against the canal wall, which is causing even more damage. So some have started thinking like maybe instead of spending a huge fortune upgrading the Panama Canal, what if we could just build a new one somewhere else? 
The Nicaragua Canal may sound like Charlie Sheen's pre-rehab nickname, but it's also a real proposal for a new shipping pathway through the Americas. I should point out that I've been saying new Panama canals. Uh, that's actually kind of a misnomer. I'm not talking about a new canal in Panama. I'm talking about new canals that can function like the Panama Canal. President Daniel Ortega announced the plan last year. It's 170 miles long from Puerto Corinto to Puerto de Bluefields, and it runs through Lake Zolotlan or Lake Mangua, but it would still need another artificial lake to fuel the locks on both sides of it. It's also 18 meters wider than the Panama Canal and three times as long and twice as deep. Sounds like a perfect replacement, right? Of course, there are issues. For one thing, it would cost at least $64 billion to build. Um, that sounds like a little bit compared to what we spend here in the United States for things, but it's a pretty big lift for a country whose entire GDP is barely a quarter of that. So of course they need to seek out funding, which they've been struggling with for more than a decade now. By the way, this isn't Nicaragua's first attempt at this. In fact, there have been proposals going back to like the early 1800s. This was actually a competing plan to the Panama Canal. And the US almost decided to build through Nicaragua because the construction of the Panama Canal in the early days was kind of turning into a disaster. The project was started by French engineers, uh, but they got mired in the difficult terrain and it just got massacred by malaria. 22,000 French workers died. Um, I did a whole video on this. I'll link it down below. Uh, it, it, was, it was a mess. It was one of the most deadly construction projects of all time, if not the most deadly one. Uh, you can watch all the details over there, but suffice to say, uh, Panama is not going well. So the US, wanting to build their own canal, started looking at Nicaragua. Um, there was just one problem with Nicaragua as they saw it. It had a it had a small infestation of volcanoes. At least that's what they got convinced of. A lobby led by a French engineer named Philippe Branu Varia uh, didn't want Nicaragua to win because they'd been working on the Panama Canal for a couple of decades at that point, and they wanted to see it through. Maybe a little sunk cost fallacy. So these guys teamed up with an attorney named William Nelson Cromwell to convince Congress to build his project in Panama. So they started a mail campaign to U.S. senators where they, they mailed them letters to try to talk them out of the Nicaragua plan. Uh, and, and they chose a pretty sneaky way to get the message across. They sent these letters with a Nicaraguan stamp that featured the construction of its railroad. Uh, just so happened in this stamp right behind the railroad in the picture was a smoking Mount Mamatombo. Subtle, guys. Yeah. A stamp freaked them out. Imagine being scared by a postage stamp. Elvis on a stamp? The dead are rising! It didn't help that in 1902, a volcano erupted in the Caribbean that killed 30,000 people. So yeah, Congress freaked out and wound up backing the Panama Canal instead. But then after the Panama Canal was finished, you know, it just, it kind of seemed like a solved problem at that point. So there's just never really been enough interest to make it happen. But with the drastic increase in shipping traffic and all the problems at the Panama Canal, that's all started to change. Nicaragua's president's trying to negotiate a deal with China to construct the canal, but so far it's not looking good. They actually broke ground on the project more than a decade ago with funding from a Hong Kong investment company, but the deal fell apart. President Ortega submitted a new proposal in November to a group of potential investors, but yeah, so far nobody's biting. Critics of the proposal say that the canal isn't a feasible plan. Uh, there's concerns about the environmental impact and the fact that it would displace thousands of families to build the thing. Which, I mean, thousands were displaced and died building the Panama Canal, but those were different times, I guess. There's also a lot of unanswered questions about whether or not there's enough water in the region to support a canal. And some have even suggested that the whole thing is just a distraction from Ortega's human rights abuses, of which there are many. Ortega and co-president Rosario Murillo are being investigated by several human rights courts for every kind of thing a dictatorial regime can do. They're accused of making politically motivated arrests, mass deportations that amount to human trafficking, forced labor, there's more. Amnesty International accuses them of using their power to quote, intimidate, punish, and eradicate any form of political opposition or defense of human rights. Gee, I wonder why nobody wants to go into business with these guys. So for now, it looks like Nicaragua's canal is not really going anywhere anytime soon, but the need for it is still growing. So there's a lot more people talking about it than there used to be. But what else is out there? There's another proposal for a canal in southern Mexico called the Interoceanic Corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Say that 10 times fast. It was first proposed two years ago with ports running from Coatzacoalacos to Salina Cruz. The canal would be 188 miles long and would cost at least 2 billion pesos. That's about $97.1 million. And that's just for the first two years of construction. But it's estimated it could move 1.4 million containers a year. 
And kind of like the Nicaragua Canal, this idea goes way back. In fact, it goes back to the 16th century. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés wrote in letters that he thought that it would make a great canal route. Then as Spain took over the region, they started surveying the isthmus with the canal in mind, and eventually in 1814, they actually issued a decree to build the canal. But by the time the work got started on it, Mexico became an independent nation. Work on it officially started in 1842 under businessman Jose de Garay. Uh, it took a year to recruit 300 convicts to do the work, but revolutions pushed back the start date until the funding ran out. Six years and one Mexican-American war later, the U.S. started showing an interest in building the canal. The U.S. won California from Mexico right before the big gold rush, and that actually provided a new fundraising source for construction, but unfortunately both countries would need a peace treaty to use the route, and wars tend to make peace treaties hard to achieve. The project would then bounce from business to business. Time and again, they would try to attract investors only to fall or face political pushback and pass the concession on to another company. And then again, the Panama Canal opened, and actually by that point, railways were running cargo across Mexico. So again, seemed like a solved problem. The project was abandoned. Until now. And it is a perfect idea for a new canal that will solve all the world's shipping problems. First of all, the canal's ports would need significant upgrades, which could drive the price up by billions of pesos. And the route of the canal wouldn't be one long stretch of water. Cargo would still have to be loaded onto trains to finish the route, which adds time, manpower, you name it. And the area is also plagued with some of the same issues as the others when it comes to the threat of water shortages, which could cause all kinds of delays. There are similar issues about land rights and the environment. Yeah, the, the people who live along the, the route would be displaced, and the government's trying to buy the land from them, but they're offering absurdly low amounts. And this is a part of the world where poverty is extremely high. And environmentally, again, the canal's construction could contaminate the air, water, and soil in the region, and could possibly wipe out entire ecosystems. So yeah, second verse, same as the first. The interest is there, it's just not all the way there. Now there is a third option to replace the Panama Canal, and its name is the Panama Canal. I mean, if those two canals aren't feasible, why not just improve the working canal we already have? Crews expanded the Panama Canal in 2019 with locks that are 21 meters wider and five meters deeper. Uh, the project also added two new sets of locks to the Atlantic and Pacific sides. There are also some ideas floating around to fix the low water levels in the canal. Uh, so last year, there was a proposal to build a new dam for the Rio Indio River that runs southwest of Lake Gatun. Unfortunately, <laughs> Again, I keep repeating myself here, the dam would flood the homes of 2,000 people who are already living well below the poverty line in the region. The region would also need to create more dams for more rivers to create more water sources, leading to more displacement, and it goes on. Of course, you know, I, I hear this though, and I keep thinking that with all the money that would be made by a new canal, I can't imagine they can't afford to pay these people handsomely for their land and time and property. I don't know, it's not an easy problem to fix, and it's going to be unbelievably hard to work out some kind of balance between the, the risk and the benefit so that it, you know, equals out for everybody affected by it. But let's just say the absolute worst happens and the Panama Canal just completely fails. It would be a devastating economic and environmental loss for the region and the whole world. But that is a possibility. The effect of climate change will definitely lead to more droughts. That means lower water levels, which means less ships would be able to pass through the canal. And it needs to be said that America just pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords again, which is probably the minimum any industrialized nation can do to fight climate change. It's kind of hard to get some of our own leaders to acknowledge that the words climate and change need to sit next to each other in a sentence. So it's not going to be getting better anytime soon. An alternate canal could provide some additional routes if water levels sank to a dangerous level, but it doesn't look like there's much progress getting done on that. People have also floated around the idea of creating more rain by cloud seeding in the region, uh, but it's actually not even known if that would work in climates like Panama, and besides, that's, that's only a temporary fix. All of that is uh, uh, not good stuff, but there is a glimmer of hope in all this. So some of the fixes and additions to the canal are working. The Panama Canal has 18 new water basins installed in its most recent expansion that can recycle 60% of the water it uses. New initiatives like the Canal Authority's Green Connection Environmental Recognition Program are showing how the canal can reduce fuel usage and create less greenhouse gases. Maybe those improvements and the, the good news that are coming out of it, maybe that will spur nations and corporations to further upkeep efforts and make the canal more efficient and usable. And the canal has even created some benefits beyond, you know, economic positives that have boosted Panama's economy over the last century. For example, it led to the creation of Chagres National Park. Uh, Chagres National Park helps to protect the surrounding rivers, which is not only good for the environment, it also helps feed the lakes that power the canal's locks. So maybe those positives could build momentum for the creation of a new canal, but it's not without sacrifice. 
So even if Trump's plan to acquire the Panama Canal doesn't work, it has helped grab some attention and it gets us to kind of look at it, think of ways that it can be improved. Because there are problems in the Panama Canal, just not the ones he's talking about. And if we did take it over somehow, those problems aren't gonna go away. In fact, it would cost a lot of money to fix. And besides, at least people are talking about the Panama Canal, which is itself kind of a, a microcosm of the bigger problems like rolling droughts and the economic effects of climate change. Maybe just talking about it could help inspire more calls to action. Look at me being positive. So yeah, if it feels like you've been hearing a lot more about the Panama Canal lately, um, you're not crazy. It, it has been in the news a lot more than it used to be, and for good reason. Like you can see in these stories that Trump's been saying that the Chinese are putting pressure on Panama and that the US has a rightful claim to retake the canal. The Panamanian president says that he's lying about that and that it's an affront to their sovereignty. There have been protests and strikes in Panama over those last few years. It's been a big old mess. And of course, depending on what media you get your stories from, your opinion of this whole story might you know, be totally different from somebody who's getting it from another media outlet. This is why I like Ground News. Ground News doesn't just aggregate articles from sources all around the world, which itself is important. You get a more global view of things, but they also filter them by media bias. So you know the angle that the sources are coming from. This story has been covered by over 90 sources. So it's interesting to see how bias affects the framing here. So for example, you got Town Hall and the Daily Wire, they're right-leaning sources. They're focusing on the US reclaiming the canal, while the left-leaning sources like the Daily Beast focuses on the Panamanian president accusing Trump of lying. And as you can see, each of these has a factuality rating based on that source determined by third party media watchdogs, but also shows who owns the outlets, so you can get an idea of what conflicts of interest they might have. And it's got a handy little bias distribution chart, so you can see how much of one side is covering the subject over another side. But if you really want to go down the rabbit hole of bias, they've got a handy blind spot feature where you can see stories that are being covered almost exclusively from one side of the political aisle. And this is super helpful to really understand how people on the other side of the aisle might see things totally differently and have different opinions from you. They're literally seeing news stories that you're not and vice versa. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer, and their goal is to give you more information about your information. We currently live in a deeply fractured media landscape rife with misinformation, and Ground News is a good tool to see through all that madness and actually get some clarity. I've said it before, I really feel like this is the future of news. Like, we're never going back to the days of Walter Cronkite, where there was one news voice that was trusted by all. In today's landscape, you need a tool like this to navigate your way through and see the truth. So if you'd like to experience the future of news today and maybe get a little bit smarter about your media consumption, just head over to my link, ground.news.com slash Joe Scott. For a limited time only, you can get a 40% off Advantage Plan subscription, which is what I use, to get unlimited access to all their features. You can find that down in the description or just scan this handy QR code on the screen right now. Anyway, thanks to Ground News for supporting this video and bringing a little sanity back into the conversation. Links down below. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope that was interesting to you. And if this is your first time here, um, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. You might find some on the little sidebar on YouTube or scroll down below, who knows what they might show you. See any of them that have my face on them, give them a click. And if you enjoy them, uh, I do invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos, not every Monday, maybe every other Monday or so. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And uh, you know, leave a comment down below. Do you think any of these projects are actually gonna work or see the light of day? Um, do you think it's all a bunch of bluster? Uh, is, are we in some kind of danger from the Panama Canal shutting down? Any thoughts? Let me hear them. But that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.